Ladies and gentlemen, as president of the Plymouth Institution, I welcome you to Sherwell Church Hall today for a very special lecture. I extend a welcome to the Deputy Lord Mayor, who has rendered such signal service to the city and citizens. I also welcome the invited members of the Emergency Committee and the Special Purposes Committee, so that the civic authorities can link themselves officially with this celebration. We welcome also the Commander-in-Chief and Lady Letham, with the Chief of Staff, Captain Gandal, and representatives of other organisations in Plymouth. This day marks the 300th anniversary of a battle famous in the long history of Plymouth, correctly designated the Sabbath Day Fight, popularly known as the Battle of Freedom Fields. Many felt such a noble date ought not to pass unnoticed. These views were conveyed in writing to the Lord Mayor, Lord Astor. It was thought that while the battlefield appropriately bears a suitable memorial, some short ceremony on the spot would be fitting. The Lord Mayor had replied that he had discussed the matter with several leading members of the Council, but everybody felt that as the weather was so inclement and uncertain at this time of year, attendance would be too small to justify a creditable function or ceremony. As, so far as they knew, there would be neither civic nor religious celebration, this institution felt that, despite the difficulties of war and devastation within the city, the day should be emphasised in some way. Therefore, we have concentrated upon this historical lecture. The Right Honourable Isaac Foote, promptly and generously, despite the many calls upon his time and his recent return from his vital mission to the United States of America, upon which we congratulate him heartily, has agreed to be our lecturer. As the Lord Mayor wrote to this speaker in a letter saying he was prevented from being in Plymouth, no better man could have been selected to give a talk on the history connected with Freedom Field than Mr Isaac Foote. He not only has a reputation in the West Country, in London, and in fact in Britain generally, but he has recently made a most successful tour in the United States. His success there could have been foretold, because over there they are as keenly interested in freedom as Mr Foote. Following so fine a tribute from the Lord Mayor, ladies and gentlemen and distinguished guests, I ask you to put your hands together for our lecturer, the Right Honourable Isaac Foote. Thank you for that most gracious introduction, Mr. President. The Civil War was a decisive event in the history of England, and in that decisive event, Plymouth played a most important part. In the opinion of historians like Professor Trevelyan, England, as a result of the Civil War, saved Western civilization. Plymouth, with Hull and Gloucester, by their stubborn resistance respectively in the southwest, the north and the west of England, saved the cause of Parliament, and it is true to say that Plymouth not only saved England, but saved her just at the right moment. The siege lasted all through the Civil War, from December 1642 to January 1646. Throughout that time, Plymouth was again and again in danger and sometimes in imminent danger. But the mind of Plymouth has rightly seized on December the 3rd and the Sabbath day fight as the symbol of the town's resistance and the outstanding occasion. The town of Plymouth in that day, with its small area, had a population of 6,000. 
I have taken some care, and with the help of the contemporary siege tract and later historians, to make clear in my own mind just what happened on that historic day. Upon December the 3rd, 1643, being the Sabbath day, the enemy were guided by two royalist sympathisers who had escaped from the town and had fled to the besiegers' lines. At Lera, on the Plym, there was a small fort with three cannon. It had a small guard whose duty it was not so much to defend the place in the event of attack, but to give an alarm in any cause of danger. The danger was greatest when the tide was out, and the place could be reached from the sands. Guided by two royalist refugees, Henry Pike, a vintner, and Moses Collins, an attorney, a body of 400 musketeers, under the cover of the night, and taking advantage of the low tide, surprised and overcame the guard at Lera Point. Although the guard were thus taken by surprise, somehow the alarm was given to the town. That alarm largely determined the issue of the day. By daybreak, 150 horse and 300 musketeers fell in to take possession of Lera Point, which had been taken by surprise three hours before dawn. This defending force, so hastily summoned, were gathered on this side of the highest ridge of the town, out of sight of the main army of Prince Morris, which was waiting at Compton to make the day's attack as soon as it knew that their small light force had done its work properly. The 150 horse and 300 musketeers presumably had no reason to know that this was the day selected for the assault by the whole besieging army. While this force was hidden from Morris's army, it was unfortunately well in sight of the other section of the enemy holding their position at Mount Batten on the other side of Sutton Harbour. That section of the enemy then fired a cannon to warn the main Compton army. Thereupon, Prince Morris, whose full strength had been gathered during the hours of darkness, moved forward through Compton, down to Lipson Valley. The writer of the tract speaks of Prince Morris and all the gallantry of their army. It must have been a wonderful sight. The great moment had come. There were five regiments of horse and four regiments of foot, under cover of their own ordnance. By that time, the town's defending force, the horse and musketeers previously described, were in conflict with the royalist soldiers who had taken the Lera Point work three hours before sunrise. The arrival of the heavy besieging forces turned the scale of the first encounter on that historic day. The defenders were driven back in what must have seemed an absolute rout, a distance of three fields. The enemy's horse was mingled with that of the defenders, and some actually pierced the defenders' lines, and rushed on towards the walls of the town, where they were killed or taken prisoner. After being driven back through these three fields, the defenders stopped their rout. By this time, Fresh men had been drawn from the several outworks, and, encouraged and reinforced by this support, the roundheads held their place and kept their ground for four hours. The stand was made on a height of the hill above the Lipson Work, which was the farthest of the town's fort. The point at which this decisive stand was made is the one where the monument stands today. The enemy sent a drummer to Lipson work to demand its surrender and was answered with the shot of a cannon after he had been ordered to depart. Then a drake was brought up to a crossway and discharged four or five times in the midst of the enemy cavalry. In the meantime, 200 musketeers belonging to the trained bands of the town, had come up to strengthen the defending force. 
and another 50 musketeers had been sent round under Mount Gould or Lipson to attack the enemy in the rear. Then the commander of the Roundheads, probably Colonel William Gould, gave the order for the attack. The signal was the sound of a drum. For one great moment the issue stood undecided, and the enemy began to give ground. The sixteen musketeers, playing upon his back, as the writer puts it, had become multiplied into hundreds by his fears, and the order was given for the general retreat. Seeing their advantage, the defending force pressed forward and pushed so close upon the retreating army that the retreat became a flight, then the flight became a rout. Down the hill they rushed, floundering. The rear guard of the cavalry was cut off from the main body of the besiegers, and they tried to find refuge in the river, which lay at that time between Lipson and Lara Point. Into the mud the horses were driven, and their riders were ta all taken or drowned. Of the main besieging army, many were killed in the retreat. And so ended the Battle of Freedom Fields, when the defending force fought against odds of ten to one. The town was saved by a handful of men against all the proud army that had moved into the light of dawn on that day to what seemed easy and certain conquest. In those days, the password or sign was given to the soldier before battle. The royalist sign was, the town is ours and the Roundhead's password was, God with us. And so, by way of concluding this lecture, I will leave you with the thought that it is from that time that the town's motto was adopted, Turis Fortissima Est Nomen Jehovah. Ladies and gentlemen, I am deeply honoured that my colleagues in this institution, in respect of my work as an historian, have provided me with the opportunity to propose this vote of thanks to Mr Foot. We can truly consider Mr Foot's lecture an admirable one, and I am sure you will join me in congratulating him on being able to speak not from tradition or legend, but from the fine documents he possesses in his own library. At this point, I might make reference to the tragic loss this institution had sustained in the destruction of the siege tracts it kept in the 1941 Blitz that rendered the Athenaeum and its contents almost wholly destroyed. However, returning to today, as our Lord Mayor Lord Astor put it, no better man could have been selected to give a talk on the history connected with Freedom Field than Mr Isaac Foote. Such words have been proven most apt by the lecture we have heard today. So, Mr Deputy Mayor, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I would ask you to join me as I propose a vote of thanks to Mr Foote for his most admirable lecture.